Eva Maria Superstotis, and I'm the distillery manager. I've been here since 2013 and when we started building the distillery itself. My cousins, they started out in 2009, and of course I knew about it. They were asking questions. My um, base studies were in biology, so I have a bachelor degree in biology. And then I added to my studies, and now I have a certificate of distilling from the Institute of Brewing and Distilling in Scotland. I finished that in 2014. We were wondering why nobody made whiskey out of Icelandic barley, why nobody tried to use barley for something else than cattle feed to get more money for it. Uh, it is different strains that we have in Iceland. So we have to have strains that have 90 days to develop and strains that are specially developed for Iceland. Not all summers are good, so this is a risk every year, but uh, 2019 was a fabulous year. 2018 was a horrible year. 2020 was ah, okay, not as good as 2019, and, and well, it's a debate about this year. Uh, 2019, we got the barley down around middle of April. This year we got it down on the 20th of May mm. because the frost hadn't left. We were just waiting for the frost to leave the earth. We store all of our casks at the farm, but of course we need to get them here to empty them to bottle. So we just take as many loads as the car can take at the time. And these are just swap cars. So they have recently been empty. They're waiting to be emptied or yeah or recently been filled because we emptied them already. So, kind of what set us apart is that we only use Icelandic barley. And most of the barley we do grow ourselves. Depending on summers, then we also buy from other farmers. We do know that the Vikings brought barley with them when they settled the country. Um, and we also know that around 1500, the temperature had dropped that much that you couldn't grow barley anymore. So it's in early 1900 that trial starts again. And then in 1970, they start like full force trying to grow barley again in Iceland. And at that point, they actually got a scientist and he developed like 35 varieties that work really well on Iceland. Mm. Uh, we use one of those varieties. It's only like two that have kind of survived and been used commercially. And one of them, them is Icecria, mm. and we do use that also. We have a hammer mill. So we do it a little bit different than in Scotland. We, when we designed it, we of course had to work with what we had. And we pulled information from both US and Scotland and Ireland, just everywhere we could pull information. We pulled it and then worked it out what it would work with the Icelandic barley. And this is just next batch and you can actually smell it. This is smoked barley that we're working in now. Right. So, and it stinks up the whole place when we're working on it. <laughs> and it's smoked where? At the farm. At the farm and yeah. smoked with what? Sheep done. Sheep done? Yeah. So that's pretty special, isn't it? It is, but for Iceland it's not. Yeah. So we don't have trees, we don't have coals, we don't have gas. Every, everything you had to import. So you had to use fuel somewhere else. You had to find fuel for something else. By drying out the sheep dung, you actually had fuel to run at the farm in the mm -hmm. old days. So. Icelandic people are used to having salmon smoked with sheep dung, meat, just whatever we do smoke it with sheep dung. Uh, so of course for us it made total sense to smoke the barley with sheep dung to do the smoked version of Floki. We get more grassiness through than the peat somehow. Mm -hmm. And we just, they did a test at Macallan. Uh, so they uh, had Distiller came and visited because his friend is, is the head brewer up north. Mm. So he visited us and he got a few samples and did a test of it. And we get more of better taste through using the sheep dung than if you use the peat. So 
So probably that's the P from the sheep. <laughs> so we have a semi lower tan mesh tan. And kind of also what sets us apart is we do in-grain fermentation and in-grain distillation. First distillation has the grain still in it. Oh, I see. Uh, so our mesh tan, so basically, due to the thermal energy, we just run it on hot and cold water. We don't use, the only electricity used for this one is the computer steering and then the stirrer. It's it basically, we pay next to nothing for the hot water and we even pay less for the cold water. So using the energy from the hot water to heat up the cold water from the mesh mm -hmm. is much, much cheaper than to have a turbine to heat it up right. or element to heat it up. So. And that is everywhere in Iceland. It's always going to be cheaper for you to use the hot water than the electricity. Right. Even though electricity is also cheap in Iceland. So. Uh, we ferment for about now 72 hours. And then we have these two stills, which are kind of sister stills, our wash stills. They are old milk tanks to begin with that we changed. So you built them yourself? Yes, we did. Uh, when you start a distillery, it's kind of hard just to buy really big and expensive equipment. So we built it. It, it. And it also has the thing that the farmers had stopped using this type of milk tanks. They've gotten a better types now that works better for the milk industry. So this was just something that was going to be thrown out. And ha then you had to pay money for it to be thrown out. So they gave it to us instead. and. We kind of, just instead of cooling, we heat with them. Did it work as intended from the first day on, or did, did you have to experiment? Of course we experimented. Uh, we were building it. The first idea with these was actually that we were going to be able to do everything in one pot. So we were going to do the mashing, the fermentation, and the first distillation in them. Right. And it actually works. We managed to do it. But then we kind of wanted to grow the distillery, and if the still is kind of stuck in the fermentation that you can't distill. So that's why we built the mash tun, added the fermentation tanks. But for the first year, 2013, that was how we did it, and 14. Then we were running the fermentation in these tanks, and then we just changed the top of them and distilled from it. And then we have uh, Arnold Holstein. 300 liter pot copper still. Was it custom built for you? Or yes. Did it get, okay. So it comes from Germany? Yes. The problem that we have had with this one is that we forgot to tell them that the cold water in Iceland comes in about two to four degrees, Which not is 10 cold. to 15. Right. So we actually, the first thing we couldn't get it to run, we had to get a new one like this because this one just, it didn't go far enough down. And we just didn't think about it. It was just like everyone in Iceland knows the water is cold here. Mm. But we didn't realize that everywhere else the, the water isn't so cold. So when we are distilling, the temperature of the spirit is around 10 degrees that we're getting out. So we're using it really well. We have, uh, so we designed, it's automated. All right. To begin with, of course, it was manual. So this is automation that we have put on ourselves. So we run it like 300 times manually. We wrote every single detail down. Even the air pressure. It's like, is it raining? Is it, you know, which type of weather are we working with today? Because we knew that that was gonna have impact. We wrote everything down and then we could make the program up. So now we can just put her on and she will beep to us when we have to take the cuts. And then some staff member checks her Mm -hmm. and then says yes you can just continue or no we're going to do the cut now and then uh, she can stop on her own meaning that we can run her twice a day without having Steph here because we have taken the cuts when we leave at four o'clock so we just have to have one shift over the day but she can run twice so we actually were just filling the order for duty free so we were just, I was just bottling this last, or this week. Um, we handwrite on every single bottle. You know, from which barrel it is, the bottle, 
uh, when we're bottling it and then the distiller. Uh, we can actually trace this back down to which field we got the barley from. Okay. So if people are so interested in knowing which field, they can just email me and I can find it out and people can get a photo of the farm. We, in Iceland, we are a food factory. So we have had the problems with that everything has to be traceability. So we have the same regulation as if I had, was running a fish factory. Right. I've gotten them down that I'm not taking the same test as in fish factory because I just like, we're not gonna have that problem here. We don't have the same problems, but we will have to test for this, this and that. So we kind of had to, because we're the first one doing this. Mm. Nobody has been distilling from grain in Iceland ever. And you're still the, the only whiskey distiller in Iceland, are yes. you? Yes. We know about two or three that want to start. Uh, one is like halfway there. I think he has something in barrels. I'm not quite sure. Mm. Uh, we are now working with the government of getting uh, Icelandic whiskey labeled that you can't import casks, bottle it in Iceland and say it's Icelandic whiskey, or even just import thousand liters in a tank bottle it in Iceland and say it's Icelandic whiskey. You have to work from grain and up in Iceland. You have mm. to bottle it in Iceland and you have to use a minimum of 50% Icelandic grown uh, grain. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about the name Floki. Yes. Who came up with it and can you tell us the background of this name? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can. So uh, when we were starting this out, we were like, explorers we were exploring something new and that kind of got us back to how the vikings worked in iceland um, they were exploring they were using the grounds where they could get and they used what they had at each site so floki is actually the settler who named iceland iceland so before that it was garda gun which means uh, Garðar is, is a name for a, a man mm -hmm. or a garden and Holmi is a small island, small green island. So it was called Garðar's Holmi. Uh, he came late in the summer, so they sailed from Norway, stopped in Orkney, obviously were way too drunk in Orkney to sail. So they came late in the summer, they were too busy because the rivers were filled with salmon, that they were just having fun and didn't realize that they were going to have the winter that they had never experienced before. So they built some type of housing and then came winter earlier than they thought, because, well, we're not in Norway, we're in Iceland and they lost most of their animals. Uh, some of the people starved. It was cold. It was frost. So in February, when normally you, Europe starts to go like, oh, it's starting to become spring. And we're still like, no, it's still winter. They had, uh, he went up to one of the mountains and he could see how the ice is still coming in from the ocean. And he was like, no, no way. I will name this Iceland, I Iceland, and I will leave and never come back. He did leave, he did come back. Uh, he went back to Norway, then he come, came back, but he never settled anywhere, kind of particular. But he did have three, flo three ravens to navigate him. So he was always called Ratna Floki or Raven Floki. Uh, we have Vegvisirin or uh, the compass, the Norwegian compass, and they used to use this to navigate and also navigate in life. It was to find your way in life if mm -hmm. you use this wrong. And then we have an Icelandic saying around here in rounds, uh, the road from home leads to home. It's, it's going to be the journey you take, not the destination. Nach der Besichtigung der Brennerei fahren wir nun zunächst nach Osten, um dann in den Süden der Insel weiterzureisen, wo sich die Farm der Familie, der Betreiber der Einwerkdistillerie befindet. Erst ist die Landschaft noch bergig, auch wenn sich die Berge nicht mit denen rund um die Gletscher messen können. Es ist Anfang August und viel Grün ziert die fast baumlose Insel bis weit die Hänge hinauf. Dann aber wird die Landschaft flacher, als wir uns dem Farmland des Süden nähern, mit einigen Seen dazwischen und einem weiten Himmel. 
Und als wir nach längerer Reise auf der Farm der Familie ankommen, empfängt uns nicht nur sehr viel Gastfreundschaft, sondern auch eine fast unglaubliche Ruhe, an der wir Sie jetzt teilhaben lassen wollen. Selten einmal kann man so schön zeigen, was from field to bottle tatsächlich bedeutet, so hautnah wie hier bei äh, der Einwerkdestillerie, die ja nicht nur ein Gebäude mit der Destillerie in Reykjavik besitzt, sondern 90 Kilometer von der Hauptstadt entfernt auch äh, eine Farm, wo eben der Roggen für den Whisky angebaut wird. Und wir sind wieder mit Eva Maria unterwegs und schauen uns ein bisschen die Farm näher an. Äh, Eva Maria. Uh, this is the old farm building right here, right? Yes. So uh, the middle one used to be their barn and then on the other side they used to have sheep houses. So what they have done is, is they, we have digged out all of the dirt floors that used to be in here and put concrete instead and changed it into a barley drying facility and, and barley working site. So, and that's something we'll, we'll have now a look at and move in. Yes. So, there's a gigantic machinery in there that is <coughs> used for what? It's our dryer. So, uh, due to the fact that we have weather in Iceland, <laughs> <laughs> we are take, getting the barley in around 30% moisture and we need to dry it down to 12. Mm -hmm. So, it's a... It's a run through of the barley. So the barley comes in at the end, it, it has a conveyor that takes it all the way down to the top and then it will swivel down and hot air will cross through the barley that is passing down. Okay, and then the barley can be stored. And then the barley can be stored, yes. So that's practically your, your kiln. Yes. Then we also, this is our new machinery that we got. Um, it is to dehusk and to size so we can take have a similar size corn in the same sacks so we, we we're gonna have a better control over the mashing process and stuff for us we already talked about that uh, the icelandic barley is not easy to to work with right no it is not and one thing that it makes very hard to do is uh, to Uh, get some fermentation into it from the barley itself, right? Yes. Uh, not every year it's going to be able to germinate on its own. So we have to use external enzymes as well. Okay. And nevertheless, you always do a little bit of uh, your own uh, malting? Yeah, just really small scale uh, floor malting. Okay. And one of the interesting things with the Floki whiskey is that uh, when it's peated, it's not peated, but it's Sheep dung, right? Yes, it is. Again, it comes to tradition in Iceland. Uh, peat takes too long to rejuvenate in Iceland due to the fact that we're about five to six degrees, degrees colder than Scotland. Mm -hmm. So people learn how to use sheep dung as a burning material. And we're used to having that uh, as smoked for salmon and, and meat and everything. So this is a sheep dung. Uh, parts of it, so this just comes straight from the barn or from the sheep house. Uh, you kind of want to have where the sheep will trample on it entire winter, so they will press it down. It will lose grass into it, be into it, <laughs> and then you have to dry it for about a year before we can use it as a as a fuel. This now is to compress it yeah it kind of packages in so we can put a little bit more of yeah and so the burn is not as quick right how long do you have to burn it uh, to smoke the barley in here 24 hours yeah. so it takes 24 hours to smoke a ton at a time mm -hmm. and we have to load the smoker twice 
And this is only one part of the smoking process, as much as I, I know? Yes, so, uh, well, we do connect them together. Mm -hmm. But when we're storing them, they usually are pulled apart. Great. So this is where we have the smoke, and then the barley goes into the box outside. So this is the container. So it will hold about one ton of barley, and we have a false floor in it. Mm -hmm. Underneath, you can see the hole, we connect the smoker yeah. to it, and then it will smoke through the barley for 24 hours. And do you smell it in the house? Yes, you do. And right now we are working with the smoked barley at the distillery and it stinks. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it smells like shit in there. <laughs> Anders bei Floki ist auch die Lagerung. Denn was wir hier sehen, sind die Warehouses der Destillerie Einwerk. Und das sind ausrangierte Kühlcontainer. Eva Maria, why do you use containers for storage? Well, a few things. It's quicker than a building a house. And also to temper the temperature fluctuation. All of these are old freezer containers that can't be used anymore for transport. So they have to be demolished or, or something else so we can get them for a fair price. And then we kind of can temper the fluctuation because sometimes we're having temperature fluctuation about 10, 15 degrees in a day. So you maybe start the day with minus zero, you go down to 15, minus 15, and the next day you're up to two, three degrees. So they are isolated? They are isolated. So we're trying to get the fluctuation a little bit slower because if not the angel share is going to be so high because right. they are the, the the air in iceland is so dry there's no humidity here that the barrels are continuously trying to get wet on the outside so they are kind of doing this kind of quick <laughs> so the, the thought that a lot of people have is because you're so much up in the north maturation here is very slow no it's the other way around and that's why because there is no humidity in the air. The barrel is trying to get wet on the outside as it's in the, in the inside. So it's pushing and pulling much faster. Okay. And that means that uh, the angel share is uh, in... It's a little bit higher, but we don't lose... We lose more water than alcohol. Mm -hmm. So it will... The alcohol will also go down, but less than the water. So we lose more in, in volume than in alcohol strength. Right. How many, how, how many casks do you have in, in the storage right now? We have about 420. And where do you get your casks from? So this one came from Spain, from Casknolia. Uh, this one is from Space at Cooperage. So you can kind of see the difference in them. So the Space at Cooperage casks have been used before? Uh, not anymore. Not anymore. Uh, to begin with, we did buy a few uh, what was it called Refur refurbished yeah refurbished casks but then we changed over to only getting new casks but the thing is in um, the use old hoops that they have on the building and also they store them outside so that depending on if they have been stored outside for a long time how they're going to look because we have had barrels that almost look like this from spade side as well then, then they just didn't stand outside before they ship them. And you will have to expand with more containers, I think. Yes, we do. And here in the second container are the rye casks. They come from Spain, but unlike you would uh, think that uh, that they have been used for, for sherry before that. No, no. These are brand new casks that we got. So we're going to do rye young malt or young rye as well. And then we're going to do a three-year-old rye after those. But we did choose to have them only 130 liters to get a little bit quicker aging on the rye. And well, you can see this one is also 200 liters, but it is brand new. So the Casanolia both makes sherry casks or brand new casks. Wir haben jetzt noch ganz spontan die Möglichkeit bekommen, eines der Felder mit Gerste zu besuchen, die für den Flocke Whisky verwendet wird. Das hier befindet sich ungefähr ja, 15 bis 20 Kilometer von der Farm entfernt, äh, im Süden der Insel. Und was ganz interessant ist, äh, 
und das sehen wir gleich auf der anderen Seite des Feldes. Dort hinten, äh, links neben dem Auto, sieht man den Vulkan mit dem unaussprechlichen Namen, dem wir ein, einen Reiseausfall im Jahr 2010 ungefähr zu verdanken haben. Jetzt ist er ruhig, liegt ganz unge ungestört da. Aber zurück zum Feld. Das hier ist eines der Gerstenfelder. Und wie man sieht, ist äh, die Reifung hier noch nicht besonders weit fortgeschritten. Man schätzt, dass es ungefähr noch einen Monat dauern wird, bevor man die Ernte einfahren wird können. Und aufgrund des doch etwas nassen und kühlen Sommers, der hier herrscht in Island, wird man wahrscheinlich auch nur eine kleine Menge einfahren können. Die Körner sind noch nicht sehr groß, sie tragen auch noch nicht die Milch, an der man sieht, dass die Reifung schon fortgeschritten ist. Die Milch ist das, was man erhält, wenn man diese Körner presst in diesem Zustand. Das ist noch nicht der Fall. Zu guter Letzt geht es ca. 20 Kilometer von der Farm entfernt unter die Erde. In eine von über 200 Erdhöhlen auf Island, die dort wohl seit dem 4. Jahrhundert existieren und auf eine sehr frühe irische Besiedlung Islands hindeuten. Uns interessiert aber der Inhalt dieser menschengemachten Höhlen, denn dort reifen seit April dieses Jahres drei Flohgefässer, die uns aller Voraussicht nach in ca. vier Jahren als Sonderabfüllung begegnen werden. Etwas Geduld werden wir also noch aufbringen müssen. Mit diesen Aussichten und einer Aussicht auf die Trennlinie zwischen der amerikanischen und der europäischen Kontinentalplatte verabschieden wir uns von Island und der Einwerk Distillery. Wie auch in Schottland trägt hier der Whisky die Seele des Landes in sich. Im Falle von Island etwas ungebändigter, etwas rauer, aber mindestens ebenso warmherzig und gesellig.